Hello and welcome to Father Offspring Interviews, Episode 7. Um, today is a special episode. It is a double feature, um, one might say, because uh, today we have double the offsprings. <laughs> Yay! Both. I cannot tell you how much paternal pride I'm feeling right now. Okay, you ready? So ready. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, let's dive into today's questions. Um, we're going to start with a question from Derek from Ohio, who asks, um, what principles or guidelines can be used to implement, implement punishment and reward as tools in behavioral management without relying on moral frameworks? How would you determine what behaviors to punish and reward in such a system? Oh, very hard question, but appropriate one if you're going to do this. There's no free will stuff. Um, from the punishment end, instrumental, I mean, you can get sea slugs to change their behavior with punishment. Punishment could be very effective in the right setting. Um, one major caveat comes through with that, though, which is to endless be, endlessly be aware that people like to punish People like to punish. Righteous punishment gets dopamine going like there's no tomorrow. So be very, very certain that you actually have an efficacious tool uh, in using punishment rather than just enjoying it. Um, as a mirror of that uh, reward, likewise, it makes no sense in the world without free will, yet it could be an extremely effective instrumental tool there. And great example of that in terms of encouraging people. My, my colleague at Stanford, Carol Dweck, has done these famous studies where your kid or your kids do something wonderful uh, academically, and you could either say to them, wow, you did so well on that test, you must be so smart, or wow, you did so well on that test, you must have worked so hard. And the latter is definitely preferable and it's getting into some types of praise and reward are better than others. Nonetheless, one has to be aware of ways in which you can get pulled into that where it's not actually effective. Okay, I have a confession to make here in the realm of like, oh, I believe all this stuff, but I can't actually follow through on it most of the time. There's a realm with praise and reward where I still have a horrible vulnerability, which is when I'm teaching and I got to give out grades at the end, which I shouldn't be doing because none of that makes sense, blah, blah, blah. Nonetheless, I'd like to keep my job. So giving out grades, I definitely have this praise reward bias that it's great to have students in there where you can see like three words into what you're saying. They get it. They get it completely and they're just, this is effortless for them. But to see these students in there who may not quite be in that league, but they are working their asses off. And I love them and I find every excuse to praise and reward them, which makes no sense whatsoever. So that's something I have to be on guard against. This is a random thought, but I wonder if this is like a uniquely American perspective. I wonder if like other countries have like the same sort of idolatry of that. Yeah, well, we certainly have a whole lot of you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you just work really hard and anyone could become anything unless you're born poor, unless you're born in the wrong out group, etc., etc. Yeah, I think that's a particularly American deal. All right, next question. Uh, Hugh from New York says, I loved reading Memoirs of a Primate. One of the most evocative images from that book is you learning to dart baboons. Could you talk a little more about that experience and have you ever been tempted to dart a human? If so, why? <laughs> oh, darting. It's the best. Like, <laughs> I, I need a, a means of of injecting baboons at a distance with anesthetic and you don't want it to be something loud like an air rifle or something and so a blowgun is perfect and when I first sort of hit on that I assumed I was going to have to like fly down to the Amazon and negotiate but instead there's a company called New Dart 
New Dart in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, where you sent away your money and they sent you your blowgun kit. And it's like, it's got this instruction book with all these like guys wearing like John Deere hats and stuff talking about like blowgunning for, I guess, canine control groups. So anyway, I got mine when I was a grad student in New York at Rockefeller University, and I learned how to blowgun in my room where I would set up like the fan to sort of teach me about crosswinds and things of that sort. And it was totally cool because it's the funnest thing on earth. You get to like hunt down a baboon and start him and you're still like a conservationist because anyway so it's great I love doing it um in terms of have I ever been tempted to dart somebody almost daily um while I was first learning how to do it uh there was this octogenarian professor on campus this guy named Fritz Lippmann who had gotten the Nobel Prize for like discovering half of 20th century's biochemistry. And at that point, he basically would just shuffle back and forth, up and down the, the main part of campus with these running shoes. And daily, daily, I was tempted to dart him and see how that would go. Um, then there was a period where when mommy and I would be in the movie theaters and we'd be on the aisle and somebody's walking down the aisle there, I could not stop myself from looking at their rear end and trying to calculate how much anesthetic I would need to take them down. So yes, I've thought about that very often. I mean, she probably doesn't remember it, but there were all those times when Rachel would get out as a baby and we'd have to... <laughs> To get her Thank back God in. for yeah. retrograde amnesia. That's why I don't amnesics. remember anything. My God, such a privilege to be participating. In <laughs> also, we had very clear-cut rules in case any of us ever accidentally darted ourselves, or like with one of the syringe things, which was to just tie us to the tree and ignore us for the next twenty <laughs> hours, since the anesthetic was a derivative of angel dust. Just, just carry on and don't, don't let the rope go long. Either. Go loose under any circumstance. Call this the, the modern day Odysseus, Odysseus and the sirens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. I want more fencyclidine. I yeah. want more PCP. This raises the, the new question. I never thought about this part, but do you think the baboons enjoyed the experience? Um, no, I think they didn't remember in the slightest. I mean, you go through this whole process, they're reasonably skittish about it, so you gotta like really try to get close to them. And an enormously interesting thing was when mommy started coming out, she was far more effective at darting than I was because she could get closer to the baboons. And that worked wonderfully, but uh, fencyclidine is a retrograde amnesic, so it was this very cheating thing. We would darts and baboon and he would go down and he would wake up later in a cage that he has no idea where he is what happened because he's just lost the previous 24 hours of memory and then we'd come along and let him out whoa i don't know who those primates were but they're terrific the way they let me go back home so yeah totally cheating taking advantage of the neuropharmacological properties of the uh Starting venture. All right. Uh, Syra from England asks, what are your thoughts on the role of mirror neurons in relation to social interaction and empathy? Is there a scientific consensus on the role of the mirror neuron system? Oh, mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are these things in the brain. Uh, they were discovered, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but a really good Italian research group about 35 years ago. And what is the initial picture of what mirror neurons do? Okay, one of you guys pat the top of your head, or both of you do it. I win. Come back. Okay. And uh, no, you're messing up the whole study. Okay, so do that. And I'm watching you do that, and I do the same. And I've just activated my mirror neurons. And it's thought to be very good for observation, learning, all of that. And from about three seconds after they first discovered mirror neurons, they said, whoa, and maybe this is even the basis of empathy in the brain. 
And that was in like the last paragraph of their first review paper on the subject. And like 30 years later, every review paper on the subject still says in the last paragraph, whoa, this may even have something to do with empathy. It's like totally exciting that it could be. The evidence isn't quite there. Um, there's a lot of people who are fans of mirror neurons being about empathy. And just to get jargony, make use of these things called von Economo neurons. But I think the most sensible people out there have said, no, it's interesting enough that it's for this, and we primates are really big on observational learning. Excellent book out there called The Myth of Mirror Neurons. It's a cool idea, though. It is. I would put it into a paper in the last paragraph and promise that for three years. All right, our next question, uh, David from Denmark asked, um, how do serious mental illnesses like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia persist from an evolutionary standpoint? Wouldn't natural selection typically weed out such conditions in relatively few generations? Yeah, fantastic question. Uh, first off, bipolar, I'm going to pretend to have heard the question as being unipolar depression, regular old depression. Um, it's maladaptive. It shortens your life expectancy. It increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, separative things like suicide, all of that. So how did it evolve? What's it doing there? And for years, sort of looking at, you know, incidence of depression is maybe 15% of the population. When you look at what life is like, and when you see the rationalizations and the self-deception and the denials that are needed to go about the world, it's always struck me that the more pertinent question is how do 85% of people manage not to get depressed? Schizophrenia, highly maladaptive as well, decreased the number of copies of your genes. And for years, I've been incredibly charmed by a theory that's been floating around since the 1930s. Okay, schizophrenia, full-blown disaster, thought disorder, social... Okay, it's horrible. And all along, when people were doing the first genetic studies on schizophrenia, looking at families that ran it, they were noticing some of the relatives had a certain personality profile. Not a psychiatric disease, just a certain profile, which came to be called schizotypal personality. And just to... <coughs> totally simplify, it's like a low-rent version of schizophrenia. You think sort of weird things. You, you're kind of socially isolated. You've got metamagical thoughts. And you're, this is the lighthouse keeper living up there alone with that social one. This is the person back running the camera in the movie theater. And this was fascinating because it seems to be on a genetic continuum with schizophrenia. Um, so one is immediately pulled into this cool area of medical genetics, which is sometimes there is a genetics to something that is a massive disaster of a disease, but the milder genetic version of it is advantageous. Jargon, homozygotic version versus heterozygotic. Classic one, everybody learns sickle cell Anemia, full-blown version of a horrible hematological disease, partially expressed resistance to malaria. Your suggestions are the same for Tay-Sachs disease. A bunch of... So you say, what about schizotypal personality disorder? People with schizophrenia are ostracized in like every culture on earth. And I've seen that in East African settings. And nobody is very nice to the floridly mentally ill. But then you look at schizotypals with a much milder version of it, and you say, whoa, what's up with them? And since the 1930s, various anthropologists have been venturing the idea that these are the people who wind up being the shamans. These are people with metamagical experiences, often socially aloof, and these are people who are very successful and often leave many copies of their genes. And I'm totally charmed by this one, that there has been selection over the centuries 
over the millennia, over the whatevers, for schizotypal personality disorder. Okay, here's a great story with this anthropologist, Alfred Kroeber, turn of the last century, and he studied Winnebago Native Americans, and it's somehow silly to ever say Winnebago, given Winnebago RVs, but he studied, and he was at some ceremony there one night, and the shaman was doing some really over-the-top amazing ceremony thing, and the guy sitting next to him leaned over and said, can you believe how great this guy is? It's like he's the best shaman we got anywhere. He's terrific. Thank God we only have one of them. Ah, you need to have the stuff going on at the right time, in the right place, not too many of you. And this is what schizotypal personalities are like. So the idea there is the advantage the selection has been for schizotypal individuals as shamanistic and the occasional third cousin who instead has schizophrenia, who is markedly selected against, is the price that you pay. Cool theory. I love it. I, I teach it whenever possible. And let's not go into this, but all you can think about is oh, this is not just them, thems with their non-westernized indigenous religions, applies to us as well. We have schizotypal thought and metamagical and all of that going through foundations of like half of westernized religions, but I will stop at this point because this gets into very tenuous area. So that, that's it with bipolar and schizophrenia. All I'm going to say is, people love astrology. <laughs> yep. Yep. The notion that we are rational, westernized beings and descendants of the Enlightenment is greatly exaggerated. Conspiracy theories, anyone? It's a good time for them. <laughs> yeah. You know, because of where Mercury is. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you want to take this last one? Let's do it. Okay. Um, all right. Last last question, which is, uh, are there any interesting traits or behaviors that the offspring Sherry Sapolsky's have inherited from you? And that's a trademarked term, that's, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say the, the trademark, yes. but it's there. Trademarked. Well, the one that is most striking to me is as soon as the family goes out, the three of us but not mommy, who looks on in bemused, whatever. the three of us sneeze because we're sun sneezers. You guys inherited that from me. It's the genetics of like pressure on your trigeminal nerve or your ocular motor muscles squeeze on your whatever in a way so you sneeze, but we are all sun sneezers. We step outside in bright sunlight. Do you know what the acronym is for that? The, the the term for it, it's no. it's one of the best like back engineered acronyms. It's um, autosomal compulsive helioophthalmic outbursts or a chew, <laughs> <laughs> and you just know someone was really happy when they made that work. Whoa, that got them tenure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what what do you guys think? Any any inherited traits? I know that like all of your most commendable ones <laughs> come from the other half of your gene pool but i think um we're, we're a good one for eye color you guys it's like the it's like a good punnett square right if you've you've got the blue blue i i got that and then mom's recessive blue and then you got the green and i got the green yeah but yeah. you got that from him but i got that from you you know what i got from you deep grooves in my molars that make me really <laughs> cavity prone <laughs> Yes. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, there's that. Uh, on the other hand, definitely any, any ability we have in, in card games, <laughs> we know which side that's coming from. There is no card game, board game, <laughs> spelling game, memory game, word game on earth where I am not so far and away the worst one in the family. Okay. On that note, that wraps up all of our questions and our fun little content for episode seven here. Um, as always, you can submit questions at the form that is found in the Instagram story highlight and bio or the YouTube video description.
Do you want to do this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. We are the Offspring Shares of Full Skis, and thank you for your continued support of science and the beard. <laughs>